Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming here. So, today I have privilege to uh, oh, welcome Mr. Ashish Bhandari. So, as most of you are aware that we are launching a new series, uh, we call it as a DigiX. So, in DigiX, what we are doing is we are uh, looking at uh, various industries and how digital transformation is changing it. Okay, so today uh, Ashish will help us understand how uh, digital transformation is working in GE. I won't take much of time. Uh, Ashish, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Ashish Bhandari. Absolute uh, pleasure to be here. Um, thank you very much for setting it up and digital transformation. I'll refer to it in some senses. Here, the topic that I thought I'll talk about and I understand you guys have just done a case study on GE, which I came to know uh, in the lounge. So I wasn't as well prepared on my GE statistics as I perhaps should be. But I would like to talk about GE in the reference of the world that we live in, the way it is changing and perhaps then build the context for, um, for what's happening in digital. Okay, so my name is uh, Ashish Pandari. I've been with GE for nearly 14 years, seven plus in the US and six uh, back in India. My background's um, engineering from IIT Bombay, worked with Schlumberger as a field engineer, primarily in the Middle East, so worked in the, um, um, in the field, did my business school uh, from the US, uh, worked with uh, McKinsey, did a startup, and then uh, GE for the last uh, 14 years. I was at this campus right after, at my, after my third year of graduation, and so have some very, very fond memories of uh, this particular place, and, and I think my mom still regrets that I didn't join uh, IIM. So with that as the preamble, um, let's get started. My First slide, our world is rapidly changing. It's, um, as you can see, it's the dumbest slide you can put. It's one line, which everybody knows it's rapidly changing. Uh, but what I thought I will is to wake us up is do a very, very simple exercise, which is, so I was born in the 70s. My dad was born in the 40s and my daughter was born, she's a millennial, so the early 2000s. So let's look at whether how the world's changing from those three perspectives. I know many of you, most of you, all of you are somewhere in between, so, so the ages may not completely align. But let's look at technology from those three angles. Yep, so my first column will be, um, so which is column A, which is technology my, uh, that I took for granted when I was born, but my dad kind of saw it happening in, in, in front of him. Yeah, so he was born in the 40s. Second column is technologies that um, I lived without, but my daughter, who is in 2000 plus, takes for granted. Okay, which is B, I was born in the 70s. And then C, stuff that she has seen a world without, but we know that technology is clearly here today. So which is C, which is 2000s plus. Okay, so let's just um, shoot off and, and we will start, yep. I'll, I'll start with one which would be very obvious computers, yep. So that would be very much here. Yep, I, I've seen a world without computers. Um, when I went to IIT, I saw a big mainframe was the first time. I'd seen a personal computers before that. But it, I've seen enough of the world without, without computers, which may not apply to many of you. But that would be one example. You want to sh start shooting off some of the things and whether they fit in column A, B, or C? Sorry, sorry. I, somebody said cell phones? So cell phones? Which group? Uh, no, 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 no. See, so the first smartphones, um, late 1990s, early 2000s. Okay, so I'll maybe put a smartphone here and a cell phone here. 
Okay, what was the next, somebody? No, Jet Airlines were very much there, yeah. You had uh, late 40s Jet Airliners were, were reasonably starting to happen. You've had the Hindenburg um, accident and the Jet Liners predated that. Maybe not as common in India, but uh, Jet Liners were actually... So airliners, airliners. Okay, okay. Maybe late, yeah, but just about, yeah. So I, in the sense that, okay, I'll, I'll grant you that, okay. Televisions, televisions here? Uh, 70s, boss, I, I'm sorry, you guys are too young for that. But I remember I got my first TV and I lived in Raurkela, but I was in class seven exactly. I remember exactly one. And Asia had 1980, where I was uh, seven years old, was when the first digital TV, color TV came out. So I'll very clearly put TV um, out here. Very, very quickly, guys. So I'll, internet, internet, um, no, telegraph is way older, my friend. Um, internet, cable, um, uh, MRI, um, there would be um, st streaming. What else, guys? Social media. No, Facebook is uh, Facebook, nine space, late 1990s. Yep. So, so, and I, to be fair, I would say my daughter was born in the early 2000s. By the time she knew world, the Facebook was kind of very much yeah. there as well. Yeah, AR, VR, you would put that here? Yep, so okay. AR, VR, yep. And then I would start to go put in maybe, you know, today, uh, gene therapy, uh, cloud computing, IoT, e-commerce was very much here. Okay, it's growing here, but it was very much here, huh? Blockchain. Blockchain, very, very good, okay. AI, so okay, look, I think the, the point is made, yeah? If you ever wanted to see the world was changing, if I went and talked to my dad about stuff, almost everything that he thought was, um, that he saw, there was very little that he saw in his lifetime that I take for granted. But with my daughter, when I have the discussion, she can't imagine a world with any of these things, yeah, which I saw happening in front of my eyes. And even in the last 10 years, how much new stuff is coming and the rate at which it is coming. Yeah, these are all things, blockchain, it is going to transform things like nobody's business. Yeah, two days ago, Times of India had an article about splicing out the cancer gene from an from, um, IV baby. Yeah, the kinds of things that are coming down in the technology empire take us back. And maybe there was a time 200, 300 years ago when the Industrial Revolution was at its peak that there was change that was happening at this rate. But in our own worlds, in my living lifetime, I don't remember a time where stuff changes so fast. Stuff that we can't live without is coming out at a rate that, um, that is so, so, so real. And the consumer world is easy to talk about. Yep, so, so we start with examples there. Uh, because the moment you get to an industry, you start to get into the technical details. So it's easy to go talk about um, uh, stuff that is common to all of us. But the... But the industrial world is just as deeply impacted. Um, last year on holiday, we went to, to Munich, yep, and uh, both my kids, we went to the BMW Museum. A beautiful, beautiful place, uh, world-class building. Um, it's got uh, BMW machines from almost 100 years, yeah, almost 100, not nearly 100, but almost. You could take a car from the 1940s and go drive that today on the road. Yep. Uh, but if you are, and BMW's profits hitting you know, through the roof, 
best years ever, doing extremely well. But if you're the CEO of BMW today, you can't sleep at night. Why? Because you've got Google, Uber, Tesla, just as three examples that are completely changing the world that you're coming, living in. Yeah, Google's coming in saying driverless car. Yeah, BMW's whole thing is the driver experience. You sit on the car, change the accelerator, the feeling that you get as the driver is the whole thing that BMW swears by. So no driver needed. Yeah, um, Uber, you don't need a car at all. Yeah, just call one when you need it, you don't need a car. And then you've got Tesla, you don't need an engine at all the way you need an engine in the traditional sense. So all those 80 years, 100 years of engineering, perfecting the, the engine that you worked on, in a matter of 15 years, your entire business model is going to be gone. Yeah, and that's the world that you're coming into. Funnily enough, and this was the debate that I was having, you take Uber's business model. You can see a time in 15 to 20 years that Uber's business model may also go away. What are the two things that Uber does that, that you really need Uber for? First thing, it helps you uh, connect with the driver very, very quickly and creates that mechanism by which you can find a driver, trust the driver, make sure the driver reaches your place. And second is the mode of payment that, that you do the payment and everything else in the background can get taken care of. The two simple actions can be done by you add blockchain with AI and the entire Uber model goes away. Yeah, the blockchain takes care of all your payments. So you, it is a trustworthy between two people the payment gets done. You really don't need an Uber. Artificial intelligence will help you. Already you have Google Maps and 50 million uh, free mapping softwares that can help you find the drivers. The challenge is you don't know whether to trust the other person or not. Is that person a driver or not? AI will fix all that. Yeah, every person will have a rating that is available, driver, customers, uh, what time they work in, what's their rating, and that won't just be limited to Uber or Ola or any platforms, those would be universal. So you can very well see a world that you don't need the $40 billion that Uber's market cap is or whatever billion dollars its market cap is. Uh, you don't need that at all. Today, by the way, Uber's market cap is, is bigger than almost any car companies. Okay, so, so you know, I'll talk about this new world where um, the new world rules here. Yeah? And uh, I'll start in the 2000s, which is a good place to, um, to, start to, to start to see some of these. The axes are, are simple. You've got uh, market cap on one axis and re uh, revenues on the, on the other axis. 2000 was, uh, was still the peak of the uh, internet boom, if you remember. And I know because I joined my startup in 2001. 2001 something was when NASDAQ was at its highest and then it crashed and people said this whole internet thing was just a bubble and you're happy it's gone away. Uh, but at that time, Microsoft was the highest market cap company um, with revenues that were very little and a market cap that was very high. Um, GE was the second biggest company in the world. Um, Amazon, PayPal, PayPal, I think, was part of eBay. I don't remember for sure. Apple, they were all negligible, very, very, very small. And then you had um, Exxon, Walmart, all of these. Yep, we look at the trend five years later. The big crash happened in 2001. Microsoft came down. All these companies out here, people were talking about, you know, the tech revolution will, will take 50 years to happen. Uh, GE is the highest market cap company. Exxon, because oil starting to increase, is starting to have good revenues and a multiple of revenue to market cap to revenue of almost one. Walmart's kind of growing, doing very, very well as well. Yeah, you get to 2010, um, GE is starting to have significant problems post the GE capital and the entire financial uh, sector going down. So. JP Morgan, GE, both coming down quite a bit. But the tech guys are still here, but there are a couple of people starting to, to emerge. Yeah, Google and Apple both. 
in a very, very real way. And both of them have got a business model which is amazing. And you see Google's revenues are still less than 50 million, but a market cap of 200 plus. So people are starting to notice that there's something uh, very real, very radical happening in the world. Um, Walmart, Exxon, Microsoft, still the biggest companies in the world. You come to 2015, um, Apple's like in a space completely of its own. The whole smartphone industry is taken off in a very, very big way. You have GE, Procter Gamble, all of these companies out here, but then you see Google, Facebook, all of them starting to show up. But in 2015, all the Netflixes, Ubers, Airbnbs, they're still relatively small. Yeah, they're not very big. Then you go to 2017, yeah, now you start to see some of the tech companies take over. And if you see today, they are off the charts. Yeah, you take a look at your top five biggest companies. They are Apple, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Facebook. They are your five biggest companies in the world. And by the time you add Alibaba's and Tencent's and everybody else, the top 10 companies in the world are all new age companies. By the time you come out here, Airbnb's market cap is more than Marriott's, the biggest hotel chain out there. Uber's market cap is more than other than maybe uh, the top two car companies, bigger than any other car company out there. Tesla's market cap through the roof. PayPal, with hardly any people, has a market cap which is 100 billion plus. Netflix, with brand new, yeah, coming into, has a market cap bigger than any Hollywood studio. And these companies are changing the world that you live in. Yep, on a daily basis. Let me now step back and maybe, as I said, I'll, I'll talk about the GE bit again. So I'll, I'll take you through, through um, so this is Dow Jones through the years, yeah, and the 130 years or whatever Dow Jones was. In 1896, um, Dow Jones was, look at the kinds of companies you had, yeah. They are all manufacturing companies. You've got cotton, sugar, tobacco, uh, leather, rubber, and these two are railroad companies. North American company in Tennessee. Yeah, it talks about the world that you lived in. Okay, by the time you get to 1928, you can see this whole class of companies, Chrysler, General Motors, Nash Motors, Mack Trucks, Wright Aeronautical, the transportation, yeah, the cars are coming into play in a big way. The Dow's been taken over by the transportation industry in a big way. By the time you get to the 1950s, this is post-World War II, you will see the beginnings of brands starting to form. Yeah, there were no brands. There were, everything was generic. It was too difficult to sell brands. There was no TV. There was nothing. In the 1950s, you start to see the brands starting to coming in. Yeah, in addition to the car companies, you will see a Goodyear and all the others uh, showing up. AT&T starts to show up in the first, for the first time. You still have Standard Oil, which is basically Exxon and the, and the mother of all those companies out there. By the time you come to 2003, you see the Dow has a very healthy mix. You have got manufacturing companies. The brands are really, really big. You've got Walmart. You've got Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Walt Disney, all those companies starting to show up. You've got a bunch of finance companies starting to show up, a couple of tech companies, if you can call AT&T tech, which I really don't think you can call AT&T tech, but those start to show up. And then finally, you see today, you see a whole host of tech companies. This is not today, this is 2015. You see fair amount of, so you can see the transformation that has happened in the Dow. One company that you don't see out here, but is here, was, of course, General Electric, was in the Dow right from the beginning and right until a couple of months ago was part of the Dow. Yeah, the only company of the original Dow index that was around, the only company that has been in the Dow for, for 130 years. So let's just step back and maybe spend a couple of minutes and I'll, I'll talk about it. 
on what did GE do to, to be part of it. And I'll, to be able to talk about it, I'll take you through a timeline and the kinds of stuff GE got into. So GE's origin is, of course, lighting. Yeah, 1890, Edison makes bulbs, figures out, we get into lighting, becomes a big business, forms uh, merge two companies, we form General Electric, the Dow gets made, GE is out there. Yeah, but it's pretty quickly, people are starting to experiment, what else can electricity do? GE starts to introduce its first electrical locomotive in 1893, yeah, that early. After that, um, by that time, Edison has always been playing around. In the medical side, x-rays start to happen. GE is one of the first people to start launching x-ray machines um, in the US. 1903, the moment you start to figure out that, okay, now I'm seeing a lot of uses of electricity, how do I generate all this electricity? Yeah, so the discussion goes from consumption of electricity to how do I generate the electricity that the world needs. GE enters and is one of the pioneers in steam power, starts hydroelectric power in early 1990s, steam power in 1903. Is, um, GE has one of possibly the only companies that has had multiple Nobel Prize winners, but two people who got their Nobel Prize prizes for the work that they did uh, while they were at GE. One of the legendary works that GE did was in the field of vacuum tubes, which is what got GE into television sets and CNBC and media in the first place. It started with an innovation, which was the vacuum tubes, which was early. We didn't do much with it for another 20 years, but this is something that we got into. Plastics, 1930s, before World War plastics. Lexan, one of the world's largest selling plastics ever, was a GE patent. Lasted GE, that one patent gave GE 40 years of revenues in, in plastics. Made the first uh, Air Force One um, that the US made. Got into jet engines in the 1940s. Nuclear power into 1950s. CTMRs, which was again a GE patent and a Nobel Prize that came with it in the 1970s. Renewables, so we launched our wind business in 2002 as a full-blown business. It's a company that was always ahead of its times. Always, yeah, when technology changed, when new things were coming in, was always ready, followed what was needed, and was prepared to invest in technology, be a leader in technology, be a winner in technology, before the time came in. And you could see the kinds of things, medical, yeah, CTs, x-rays, power generation. Even today, almost two-thirds of the times when you sit in a plane, you are sitting in a GE engine. Yeah, you go to a doctor, two-thirds of the time it's GE equipment that's inspecting you. Until five years ago, almost two-thirds of the world power, in some form or another, had GE associated with it. So that's kind of the legacy and the pedigree. The question then is what went wrong? Yeah, where did we go wrong in the last few years? And maybe you all sitting outside may have a much better perspective on this than I do. And there were Definitely many, many things that went wrong. But let me talk about a couple of things that I see from the inside. And then you can, um, you can see if, if they resonate with you or, um, or not. The first bit that I'll talk about is kind of uh, what I call as the cheese moved in power. Yeah, G at the turn of the century had a $20 billion power business that made 20 plus percent profits. Yeah, so it was generating, say, four and a half, five billion dollars of profits on an annual basis. That was GE's power business. And that was driven at its heart by gas turbines. Yeah, in the world today, there are only two to three companies that can make gas turbines really well because you need to fire gas at 800, 900 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. It's got the components that are needed are just so complex, so difficult, that only two to three companies can, um, can do it. And this is a space in which GE has 60% plus market share in um, gas-fired uh, power plants. You take a look at what happened in power in a very short cycle. So your first chart, which is the past, which is around the 2000 time frame, you, the world typically did 90 gigawatts a year of coal. 
150 gigawatts of uh, gas and wind plus solar were almost absent. There is 20 because wind was starting to show up. You look at the next five years, what you're going to get, you're going to get 160 megawatts, gigawatts each year of wind and solar. Gas, less than half of what it was previously. And coal, one-fourth of what it was previously. And other than India, Indonesia, China, there is almost, and portions of Africa, the Western world's not going to be putting a single coal power plant. And what did GE do in the interim? GE's revenues and gas power was starting to go down. So GE actually went back and acquired Alstom, which was a look in the past as opposed to a jump to the future. Yeah, and if you do the math, come back and say $5 billion of profit in power that you lost to a business today where you have wind, gas power, coal power, all of it, and you're making less than $1 billion in profit in that particular portion of the business. And in trying to work this cycle back and back and back, we lost so much of our energy, our time. We went deeper into oil and gas, all of it. Whereas what actually happened in the market was a few different things. Some that you could control, some you cannot control. Wind power is an example. Wind power takes, there are eight to nine companies that can build a reasonable wind turbine. Whereas there are two to three that can build a good gas turbine. There are eight to nine companies that can build wind turbines. The money in wind was nothing compared to what you had in gas turbines. Solar panels coming by truckloads from China. There's nothing that you can do in solar. Nothing, yeah? So the entire model and power changed. What could GE have done differently, thinking back, and what we can still do? GE was actually one of the first ones to invest in a battery plant, um, lithium battery plant, in a large scale, what is called as, as a giga plant. But we couldn't make the economics work. And GE said, I'll shut the plant down because the money that is needed to make this truly scalable is almost like a couple of billion dollars. What happened in the marketplace? You had people like Elon Musk come in saying, I will put that plant. It is OK if I don't make money for 10 years, 20 years. But I will put that plant. And that, I think, was a big difference. Yeah, we have, this is for the first time in our massive history that we did not take the risk that we should have taken. And in the world that is looking into the future, we are really struggling to figure out what is it that we can do that is truly, truly game-changing. Yeah, and, and it is not that we, we still build the world's best gas turbine. We still do incredibly well in medical devices. Aircraft engines, where there is no renewables, there is no, no super fancy new technology, we rule. Yeah, our, our aircraft engines plant is sold out for the next eight years. You can't, like it can't produce engines fast enough. But where the cheese moved, where we had to have taken one big risk, we did not. We did realize, it's not like we did not realize we had to take risks. Yeah, we got into wind power in 2002, well before wind became big or sexy. We just couldn't give, make money out of wind. And the other thing was digital industrial, where we invested very heavily into digital industrial, put $15 billion into digital industrial, and that was the discussion that was happening in the room before. We just didn't get the returns at the pace that we wanted to. The adoption rates in the consumer world are extremely, extremely high. What we found in the industrial world was then when two big industrials start to compete or, or start to come, they're always wary of each other. Yeah, even BP and GE talking to each other, you know, to get into BP, you need to cross five years of, you know, security standards. Do you meet all this? Can you connect me to this, this? Can you do all that? By that time, the consumer world and the Amazon web services of the world have put on 20,000 customers. I'll give you one other example, which I think when GST came on, all big companies went to GST by ERP implementations, a long process, big teams working on it, really, really complex. Think about the small guys, yeah, all the mom and pop companies that complain so much. I've got a very good friend who leads uh, Azure for, for India. Azure is uh, uh, Microsoft's web services. 
they launched a software um, right when all this was happening, which would allow you to take your, um, your spreadsheet output and connect it straight to the GST site in a very, very simple manner. In Chandigarh, in two months, they added 20 plus thousand customers. While on the industrial side, we would be looking to add five. It takes us one year to add one BPCL, one KN, one this, one that. The speed at which the world's moving, all industrial companies need to wake up to. And on, on GE's side, we made some other things which I'll be happy to talk about. But it was a $15 billion investment with questionable returns. So to me, these two fundamental things on top of many others, but these two really resonate with me on where did we go wrong. And it's not like we can still not come out of it. Yeah? At least in three out of the four sectors, we have a very strong story. And on the power side, we're trying to do something very innovative again. But it's too early to talk about, um, talk about any of that. So that maybe is a little bit of uh, what I thought uh, went wrong. Maybe so my last two slides here, yeah, which is perhaps my message for, um, for the industry at large, and then maybe to all of you as individuals. If I had to think about every second week, every month that I pick up the newspaper, I see things around India's software IT companies are in trouble. Yeah, automation puts 480,000 jobs at risk. IT firms struggle to generate revenue from digital businesses. India's 150, blah, blah, blah. They're all like sounding like all of this is going down south. And the India's software industry is going through, through a really big realization of, of what to do next. So my message, yeah, that this is your opportunity for offense, not defense. This is software. Yeah, who's going to write everything that needs to get done out here? These are all of it. If automation is going to come, it means you have AI, human machine interfaces, portions of robotics, algorithms, artificial intelligence. All of this is software. If you as a software company are not going to go own that space, who will? This is actually our best opportunity to go jump, whereas our, many of our industries stabilized at the, at the you know, 2000 when the whole um, the millennium thing was going on, the 2K viruses and all, our industries jumped. But after that, we really haven't seen the kinds of innovation that the infosyses of the world need to do to get to the next level. So to me, I would say offense, not defense. Invest heavily in AI. Understanding, buy AI companies, protect the space, understand algorithms, invest in data scientists, start to build out real teams. Third, partner with industries. Yet the only way all of this will come about is domain experts from the industry partnering with people that know software. And the more you can do that on a continuous basis, the better and faster you will be with solutions. And that's what the US does really, really well. That's what the Silicon Valley is all about. Fail early, fail fast, experiment, do early. That's the opportunity that the Indian software industry has today to work with industry, automotive, oil and gas, pharmaceuticals, doesn't matter which industry it is. Yeah, you can really, really, really make a, make a big, big, big difference. And that's the opportunity that all of us, Indian industry has, and then what the um, what the software industry and the IT industry in India in particular. The last thing I will say is to NASCOM in particular to drive policy in a much bigger way. India today in terms of cloud standards, security standards um, is still a step behind. And a lot of it has got to do with government because in India the biggest player in infrastructure is the government. And the government has got no policy today in terms of what kind of data on cloud can you, I'll give you examples where some of my biggest customers and some of you have worked with those companies will say that not a single data from their refinery or their plant can leave India. Yet, their own internal email systems cannot allow them to get a file of five megabytes more than five megabytes. So on their business cards, all of them have their own personal email addresses at the bottom saying, isse badi file hai to is email pe bhej dena. 
Of course, that data is going all across the world, my friend. But uh, as far as uh, if you ask them about their cloud strategy, information from the plant, cybersecurity, all of that, we have no standards at all. And because infrastructure is such a big role in India, getting policy to step up in a much bigger way is a real need in the industry today. Last thing I'll talk about is what is my message for all of you in the room out here. I've got two people out here, yeah? First is this elevator operator, next is this telephone operator. Both of these are, are jobs that really existed at one point of time for a very, very good reason, yep. There was a time, I think, when elevators were difficult to operate. They broke down on a regular basis. Um, yeah, you needed an elevator operator. You didn't know which, who was on what floor, et cetera. So you really possibly needed an elevator operator. You needed a telephone operator because you didn't have the automatic telephone exchanges, really complicated. So those jobs were very real. Many of the jobs that you and me do today are in that category, my friends. Yeah, in a very, very, very real way. And the examples that I will give you, maybe closing the loop again with my father. My father worked for sale most of his life. And uh, my earliest memories are um, he would be woken up like 2 o'clock in the night, a phone comes saying, cold rolling mill, this is the problem, come quickly. Yep, so they would run to the, you know, drive at night to the cold rolling mill. I don't know what he did, but perhaps... The plant was with Russian technology, stuff would fail all the time. And a lot of it depended on you really knowing the plant well to be able to do. And he used to talk about how it was really a great day for him to get selected for sale as part of that. By the time I grew up, I would look at sale and say, why the hell would I join sale? Yeah, a mechanical engineer that works at a plant morning to evening was not that cool. I chose to work for Schlumberger. Why do you work for Schlumberger? You get to see the world. You're doing complex things. You're running the site uh, very early in your career. And sure enough, when I was working as a Schlumberger field engineer, um, when I would be on offshore rigs, you would be completely disconnected with, yeah, other than a radio on which you could barely hear anything, you had no connect with the outside world. If something that happened wrong, and a lot of it could go, you had to go to books and books of information to go find stuff. Yeah, computers were still coming into place. So the kinds of things we were learning were changing every three months. That wireline engineer's role today, today's generation of I that comes out will look at that and say, why the hell do I want to do that? Yeah, connectivity is there 24-7. If you don't know something in a call, you can call up somebody. If you don't know how to run the equipment, you can just type. By within a second, you will get the entire program. Follow the steps. You do it. Equipment doesn't fail anymore. Computers don't crash anymore. So everything that you thought was cool and nice, me alone, doesn't exist. And even in the role that I am in today, as tech savvy as I may think I am, I know my own role will be completely useless five to ten years from now. And this is irrespective of, of what happens to the oil and gas industry. So what is my final bits of uh, message to, um, to all of you? My first bit would be get smart on software, which does not mean that you program it. But you start to understand how does it apply, how does it influence, where can it be applied in your individual industries, what does it influence? Who are the leaders? What are they working on? Why are they working on something? Read up a lot. Get really, really smart on software. Yeah, and programmers are not that smart. Yeah, they are programmers. They are just humans like me and you. It's just that they've spent a lot more time in a space which is just as important. Yeah, just as if you were... Uh, uh, you know, if you were a mechanical engineer working on a, a steam engine when the locomotives were coming into play, you were God. Yeah, it does not mean you were very special, you knew it. So all of us can learn it, how it touches our industries, how it influences. It just depends on our initiative to be able to do so. 
Second thing, which I started with, work the horizontal as much as the vertical, which is don't just be an expert in your specific domain. Start to know things around it just as much. And again, kind of, especially as it relates to software. Third, build a lot of networks, informal networks, groups that are outside of your comfort zone. Here, people that are in other industries, people that are in software. Finance, software, industry, they will all follow this trend for the next 20 to 30 years, at least. And any time you have a doubt, go draw that for yourself, and you will see where it's going. Yes, yeah, start to build those networks really, really strong and do those today. Fourth, have the realization that every industry will change. So figure out where that discontinuity is in your industry. And if you can put yourself in that discontinuity, the rewards that are available are completely disproportionate. And that is where I hope if you know all the learning, everything that you do, here today, use that time to get smart on some of these things. Yeah, whatever your industry is, whatever your field is, this can be applied. And I'm seeing it in a very, very real way in the spaces that, um, that I'm working with. And it's scary at times. It's also a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to learn these things, uh, to keep yourself up to date. But it's a scary feeling that even with you learning, you know it is, um, there's a long, long, long path ahead. So for all of you in the room who have 20, 30 years plus of your careers left, um, take this as, as the greatest opportunity that will be offered to you. Okay, with that I'll call it to a close and maybe the next 15 to 20 minutes uh, take some questions about GE, about this world, about anything at all. My last one bit would be that, you know, GE changed. But the rate at which G change is happening right now is also an influencer on why GE could not enter some of these areas that it, it should have. Yep, so maybe that's an aside for, for whatever reason. All yours. Uh, thanks, Thank Ashish. I think now we know what went wrong and we can conclude the case. No, 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 please. <laughs> Don't share so my slides. So we have uh, time for question answers. Maybe we can. Yeah, hi, my name is Aditya. I wanted to know that how is GE Oil and Gas uh, trying to leverage IoT and AI in its portfolio? Okay, I'll give you a couple of very, very um, quick examples. Uh, the first example that I will give you is our suite of products, which are called Asset Performance Management which is now starting to take um, the traditional way of maintaining a refinery, a plant, and offshore, was that every four years you would go out, do what is called as a turnaround at a refinery. Yeah, you would go maintain each particular piece of equipment at a particular interval level. Now we are starting to bring science in to create a digital twin of each asset, and hence eventually the entire plant whereby you can go and say this particular asset has run in this environment for so long. Yeah, and so I think it should get maintained at this particular interval. Not only that, it will come back and say this particular piece of instrument will actually have a failure faster than its predicted one. So you should inspect it at this level. And by the time you extrapolate it to the entire plant, you can drive entire plant profitability you can come back and say, how do you do what is called predictive maintenance? You are starting to bring algorithms that start to look at very minor changes in data because all your machines give you signals. So you're starting to bring very minute changes in signals to start to predict that this particular machine will likely have that kind of a failure so much in the future. So if you want to take care of it, you should make these changes and do certain kinds of things. We are even playing with uh, machine learning and, and voice activation to, to be able to bring some of this so that you're really almost talking to your plant eventually in a five years time period, I would say. The way you're talking to, you'll be talking to your plant kind of what's the unit, how are you thinking, what do you think can go wrong, what changes should I make, that's one. Two, 
we are starting to bring artificial in so, so for example pipeline a pipeline is say a 2000 kilometers of pipe where a problem can happen almost anywhere minutely we are starting to build entire libraries of information of what can go wrong and today humans study each portion of that pipe based on instrumentation and data that comes out to figure out what may be going wrong pretty soon in the future you will have artificial intelligence doing all of that it will be a self learning algorithm which will start with certain um, certain solutions that the human will say that if you are seeing this this is the likely cause of failure that here there is thickness loss here there is corrosion that in the future the machine will be smart enough to notice all of those patterns themselves and start to say this is what's going wrong here that is going wrong there that is going wrong there and this is not just ours in in the case of uh, airlines for example we are working our one of our best programs is with the one of the biggest uh, middle east airlines is to not look at our engines just so i'll take a step back which is uh, you, you know the comparable would be a, a human coming up and saying okay today i need to run 5 kilometers and i will take 35 minutes and every human being asked to do exactly that same thing the future will be you knowing your health history how were you made which is what are your genes built up what have you done what is your diet what is your exercise how much have you been running and based on that come and say okay run 10 kilometers 2 kilometers 80 kilometers today we run all our machines as if go run so much in a particular time and the entire industry will move in a big way by using artificial intelligence iot to do things better um, the second example i'll give you is with uh, lnt for example we are working with starting to put sensors on each hard hat knowing where each worker is starting to bring worker productivity into this how much time do you spend at each part not by book that this particular task should take eight hours but actually knowing for this particular team how much time is that task taking why is it taking how do you improve a gen set that goes bad how quickly can you bring it back into progress how, so lot of stuff where iot will come in and and have a big 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 role to play Good evening. Hi. I had two questions for you. My name is Mukund. Uh, first question, uh, GE had a super CEO, Jack Welch. And then after that, the drop in market share coincided with uh, the change in CEO. You had Jeff Immelt coming in. And then after that, again, he had a very short run. I think he was there for a year or Ooh. two, Jeff Immelt. Okay. 11 years. Okay, I'm sorry. Seriously? Then, but then... No. The, sorry, so when did, when did Jeff Immelt come in? 2001 okay. and then so no few months before 9-11 but he had officially there was a small overlap with and I wasn't at GE then so those are all stories that I have heard as well so the, look I'm uh, not uh, going to answer any questions relating to leadership or succession or anything no, yeah. my question was not that my question was what initiatives did GE take to come up to a, a better position after the superstar status which it had for a long time and second question is, GE had an uh, initiative called GE Digital. So how are you applying that in uh, various businesses today? Well, so that's a, the, all the but examples. That is, that I is, could go talk about days on everything that we are doing in GE Digital. The heart of it is the Predix platform, but software overall. So one of, from an organization perspective, GE combined its um, GE, uh, all our ERPs, all our, the entire CIO role with the chief digital officer role reporting straight into the CEO, made it a vertical by itself. We went out to Silicon Valley, San Ramon, opened up our own uh, big place out there to start to start to think like how software companies do in a sense. This is all on an organization side. In terms of our work, we invested very, very heavily in the Predix platform. We have bought a multitude of companies around cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, um, algorithms that you can ingest into sensors because in the IoT world, the industrial sensors are 1000x more complicated than the, than the sensors that you will see. We have done partnerships with SAP, with Microsoft uh, for cloud capability. 
um, in addition to a variety. So those are some of the tasks. And then the biggest, biggest task is on building these apps that I was talking about, yeah, which is the work that is going on in each one of the product lines that, uh, that I would talk about. In terms of your first question about falling from your grace, I talked about why I thought we did. It's not like the rigor at GE went down ever. I think it came down to me personally about the risk that we took. And in some one particular case, the risk that we did not take. Yeah, but it is still a company that has some incredibly smart people. GE out of a Bangalore center alone, even now, we generate 250 patents a year filed in the US. One patent a day filed in the US. The question is, what do we do and how do we leverage some of that capability? That story, though, hopefully, is the story of the next five years. Yeah, so how do we rise given a chance again? I think uh, that maybe if I get an opportunity to come back in the future, I could talk about. So. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, so uh, my question is about more about human judgment in current uh, mergers that are used. So GE signed up with l &T to manufacture uh, subsea equipments in 2016. So apart from the obvious reasons where l &T has manufacturing capabilities and GE has the technology, what all parameters do CEOs actually think before going into a partnership with a company like L&D or a company like G, who both are capital, not capital staff companies. Both of them can build the technology or the manufacturing uh, setup. Okay. Yeah. So I'll give you that very specific example. That was done because we knew India would be going deep water in a very, very big way. And all the yards that we used for manufacturing globally were in uh, Batam, in Indonesia, in China, in uh, Aberdeen, or in Houston, and in uh, uh, Rio for, for Brazil. Uh, our choices were to come in and invest a big yard ourselves, or to leverage someone like LNT, which had done 80 to 90% of the investment already. So in Katupali, which is on the eastern part of India, LNT has one of the best yards in India already. And the other decision that was very clear that if we set up something of our own, LNT would go partner with one of our competitors. Yep. So the question was, do you make friends or you do make enemies? And the answer, that one was honestly one of the easier decisions. The only question there was, why did you do it in 2016 when the projects are happening in 2018? Was completely to, so that we get a year plus to partner. Because some of the capability that is needed out here in terms of know-how that we need to transfer and all, it took us that long to, um, to deliver it. Yep, so, so that was the, of all our partnerships, I think that one was a relative, relative no-brainer. Um, overall mergers and acquisitions in the recent past has not been GE strength at all, yeah, and talking about the Alstom one in particular uh, was, a, was a really, I think uh, Flannery himself has gone on record to say that wasn't one of our best efforts. Even within oil and gas, a couple of the big ones that we have done uh, before the market fell were really not the best choices at all. Both because they took money out from something like else that we could have done that would have been bold and scary. And also equally because it took our time away from doing that to working on integrating that integration, bringing it into the business and all that. Sir, just a follow-up Just a follow up of that, I understand with the acquisition of Baker uses, you can now operate on upstream, midstream, and downstream segment. But given the backdrop and the rationale that you see that oil and gas are going down and solar and wind is going to take up, so what was the logic that you have guys went ahead? So, yeah, on the Baker one in particular, if you take a look at the timing of the Baker one, yeah, when Baker acquisition was announced, the oil price was low 40s. Yeah, so we, for a change, were buying something at the very, very, very bottom. And, and thankfully, that has been proven out at least in the last year and a half. Yeah, unlike Alstom, which we bought when a lot of the bad news related to this was not priced in, Baker was bought in right at the bottom of the market. And Baker was a partnership, not that. I'll say two things. One, with Baker, we are really able to go to the market and offer stuff that we could not in the past. Yeah, Baker's upstream and subsurface capability, their ability to understand the reservoir, 
with GE oil and gases equipment and ability to do big projects at scale globally, if we combine the two, we can go out and do things for customers that neither business could. We had a big cost layer that went away immediately by putting A and B together. And some of those has been proven out. If you take a look at our numbers, we're actually having a very easy time hitting our synergy targets, um, all of those targets that we set out as a business. So the Baker one, and I could still be proven wrong, I would say that was a good decision because we needed it for our oil and gas business to survive, and Baker was a very, very good partner. More and more of the projects in the world now are becoming on the services side in oil and gas. Schlumberger, Halliburton, Baker. It's just three. Everybody else is out of the market. It's almost become like that uh, Geo, Airtel, Vodafone game, yep, where the consolidation is, at least to me, has helped considerably. And we have got a couple of very good wins in India also to talk about that we could not have done otherwise. Hi. Here. Yeah. Okay, I saw her hand like right from the beginning. So I'll, I'll take her question and then I'll come to you next. Uh, good evening. My name is Panjiri and I have been with uh, Shlambaje for about 10 years before I moved to IIM Ahmedabad. Extending to your point about the prognostic health management of the tools, wherein you are reassessing if a certain tool or if a certain refinery or equipment needs to be maintained at a certain interval or not. From what I, where I saw, there were, a lot of cha there were a lot of challenges in terms of implementation. So how has been G's take on that front? There is an idea and it is in the way of getting executed. But how is G exactly attacking the problem and how far in future you think this will be uh, a regular thing to do and not something that is innovative in the market to be done? No, no, it is still innovative and will continue to be innovative for quite some time. Um, it will be innovative because first you are talking about at the equipment level. By that equipment level, then you will be talking at the process level and then finally at the plant level. The plant level capability is still several years away. Yeah? Today we don't even have proper digital twins at the equipment level. So this is something that I see a long, long rope for technology to play in for quite some time. How do you go implement it? You go implement it from two ways. First, you start to get into really close partnerships with specific customers. Um, for example, for us, we have announced two really big partnerships, uh, one with BP, where BP is all of North America platforms, one by one by one, will be going digital with us. The second one with Rosneft, and there is some announcement with Aramco, et cetera, as well. One is on the partnerships, too. From a capability perspective, this one now within GE has a complete sales team, completely owned set of products that are not part of any of the traditional products where if you sell a compressor and if there is a, you know, you're selling a $20 million compressor, you really don't care about the $200,000 software that you sell with it. Now there is a complete team that is paid, monitored just on the software basis. And, but that's not just GE doing it. Yeah, Honeywell's doing it, Emerson's doing it. There are, IBM is starting to get into that space. So you will see a lot of new competitors coming into, into this whole digital health management, asset management um, space. And I don't know what the winning story will be because that story is still to be written. Yeah, so uh, Ashish, I'm Saurabh. I, I come from the house of Siemens, which is okay. a big competitor of GE, but I'm a great fan of Jack Welch. So Jack Welch followed a three-pronged strategy. So during the times of uh, when he took over, he divested from businesses which were making losses, invested in the upcoming technologies. But there was a third important segment where he focused on uh, developing the leadership to take on the challenges of tomorrow. So I just want to know from your perspective, what is GE doing right now to prepare its leadership to take on the challenges which we have okay. of the next So time. I'll maybe, so when I joined GE, I actually joined GE with very low expectations. Um, I'd just come off a startup. I just needed a place to stay in for a couple of years and then go do something of my own again. And that was in 2000, end of 2004, beginning of 2005. 
So I stayed at GE because I believed firmly in its ability to uh, build culture, build leaders. Um, so I'll talk about a few different things, yeah, which, and which are all, I mean, it's not like ML's period, the focus on people went down at all, yeah, by, as an example, GE in Crotonville has a training center which is completely world class, yeah, we have the best professors, so it's not like we were seeing this digital wave, globalization, being taught to us for 15 years. Yeah, it's not like the, and, and the, the focus on running a quarter, focusing on hitting your numbers is as intense as it ever was. Yeah, so that bit on, and people on culture in terms of building a culture, talking about it, building teams, how do you take teams and take one way of thinking across, which was, which GE was very, very well known for. It was in your DNA almost after a bit. That is still very, we are changing a few things which, you know, a couple of years ago we went away from ratings. For the first time in GE's history, we went away from ratings. We had a nine blocker on which everybody got rated. What happened? No, 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 we, we are looking now to bring it back. <laughs> We are now looking to bring it back because it becomes almost impossible. So what we happen, and I'm sorry, I will digress. Um, so on my, um, on, my, uh, on my phone, I have an app. It's called PD. It's called Personal Development. That's a tool. And that tool allows me to give, me fee to give feedback to everyone above me, below me, to the 150,000 plus people in the company, anybody that I work with. The idea of the tool is that the new world is horizontal. People really don't like this rating things. People like to be told what they are. They're all working differently. We are all one flat organization, all that. That's great. Yeah, the challenge that was happening was that the ratings really gave an individual a sense of where they stood. Yeah, the discussions at the end when your EMS happened were so real because people could know if you were rated a star, you were really, really a star. Yeah, which one out of 10 people would get rated in that, uh, in that top right bucket. That rigor went down. We saw that in using the PD tool, 90% of the feedback was positive. You did this very well today. Yeah, this is not how Amazon works. Yeah, this is not how you, people would have a tendency, especially in written, to go give positive feedback. And then you had no ratings. So at the end of the year, everybody would come back thinking, I had a great year. Look at all my feedback. Everybody thinks I'm fantastic. Yeah, so that discussion became very dependent on the leader himself or herself. Good leaders would spend the time making the discussion around career. The discussion on career at GE is a very, very real discussion because you talk not only about how are you performing, what do you need to do better, also about where would you see yourself three years from now. The company talking three years in advance on whether they think your expectations are correct or not. Yeah, that if you think you are walking this track, the company also thinks that's the right path forward for you. So that gave a lot of alignment. That is still happening, but I am actually, after being, and that's a change for me, I'm a big proponent of bringing ratings back. It's a bloody competitive world out there, yeah? And if you're running a company which works in 160 countries, is 24 seven, if everybody is rated excellent or you have no ratings at all, how do you manage anything at all? It works very well in software where you have one center, 3,000 people, everybody working out of one roof. You can do that very, very well. You can't really do that very well in, in the kind of world that GE lives in. So that's my one bit. But I have an app. I can do, I can, even today. So GE invests a lot still on the people side. Yeah, we have always. And the only thing, most other companies would have broken down under the stress that we went through in the last two years. Yeah, To think about the stature of the company where you're firing one leader after Another, we have had a cream go out, everybody. Most companies would have broken down. I can tell you that, gee, as much as bad stuff that you hear, 
and there's a lot of change. From a business by business perspective, we are as competitive as ever. And any time you go sit in an airplane, if you see a G engine, you can smile. I know there are lots of questions, but due to time constraint, maybe what you can do is those who still want uh, some questions to be answered, you can forward your mails to PGP speaker series email ID, and we'll help you get those answers for you. Okay. Uh, so I would request uh, speaker series team to facilitate our speaker today. Look, thank you all for having me. I know it's uh, five o'clock, so. You would all have better things to do. The fact that you spent it with me is very much appreciated. I hope it was somewhat worth your while. Thank you very much. You can reach out to me for any thoughts, anything else otherwise as well. Thank you, folks. We'll have Thank a group much. picture. We'll have